Good morning friends and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. Today we are going to uh, do lecture number 16 and if you can recollect well, we are dealing with some such Indian poets in whose poetry we have got a sort of existential tinge. In this regard, we have already done uh, the uh, poetry of Kamla Das and uh, after, after Kamla Das, we did uh, Jassawala and uh, we have also uh, now on our cards Jeev Patel, fine. So, today uh, we shall be discussing uh, the poetic world of Jeev Patel. Now, before we go into uh, the poetic world of Jeev Patel, let us have a background uh, in which uh, Jeev Patel appeared as an Indian English poet. My dear friends, we know uh, that the climatic conditions are also very important in the making or the marring of a poet. By climatic conditions here, I mean uh, the social and the political scenario that are prevalent uh, in an age. It is in this regard that G. Patel, when he appeared on the Indian literary scene, it was actually a scene of post-independence. And presently, the poets that we are discussing, majority of them uh, are post-independence poets. Now, the post-independence poets, if we simply take some example apart from India, we can also find that all around the world also there were several struggles, several wars were being fought. For example, in Vietnam, Bangladesh and uh, Middle East, wars were being fought. And in 1969, uh, there was a Gujarat riot which actually affected many of the poets of that time, followed by uh, the emergency which was clamped on India and Indian masses in the year 1975. So, all these actually led to a sort of chaos in the society and poets and writers got very much affected. It appeared as if for a time being society had become quite insensitive, but at the same time writers with their own uh, uh, poetic credibility, uh, their own poetic uh, consciousness, they were also fighting a sort of movement which we can consider to be uh, a, a sort of a green movement. There were many writers and here the writer or the poet that we are discussing, he is also one of uh, the members of that green movement. Now, let us have an introduction to the poet. My dear friends, you have already uh, uh, read about the poetry of Nisim Ezekiel and also of Darubala, these two poets and, and also of uh, Jashawala. All these three poets were from a different religion, they were actually from a different community and apart from uh, being an Indian, they actually at times felt that they uh, were treated or they had the feelings of being an, a sort of outsider. Today, the poet that we are discussing, G. Patel, he also belonged to a sort of minority community because he was from a, a, a Parsi uh, community. Uh, if we come to see uh, his uh, uh, bio, we can find that he was born in 1940 uh, in Bombay uh, to Parsi parents who uh, belonged to a very small village named uh, Nargol in southern Gujarat. Actually, his initial education, I mean the education of uh, uh, this uh, poet, uh, namely, I mean uh, this poet that we are discussing, uh, actually he got his education in the schools, nearby schools, but then he actually wanted to be and his parents wanted to uh, make him a doctor and that is why that is why his early education was in the field of uh, medicine and then uh, G. Patel was an Anglo, Anglophone uh, poet, fine. He also uh, even, even though apart from his own language uh, that he knew, 
he also started writing in English and then not only did he belong to a culture of minority community, but he was also one of the members of uh, the Bombay poet circle. He was actually a physician by profession. So, we can consider G. Patel uh, to be a poet, a physician and also a sort of poet. He actually was uh, very much attracted towards poetry and uh, we can find a sort of impression of surrealism in his poetry when uh, we uh, look into the details of his uh, poetic over. Uh, he also held several art uh, exhibitions namely contemporary Indian art, uh, then grey art gallery and then he also held some, some exhibitions in New York City in the year 1985. My dear friends, even though G. Patel uh, could not compete much uh, with uh, uh, the uh, contemporary poets as regards getting some awards or uh, uh, getting uh, some recognition, but the books that he published they actually speak volumes about him because he was also one of the experimentals and as an experimental poets, we can find in the works of uh, G. Patel uh, something that you can uh, call not only a sort of linguistic experimentation, but also a sort of experimentation uh, which also can be considered to be a part of avant-garde uh, uh, movement uh, because uh, through his own uh, expertise and skill, he was actually trying to create a world which many other poets of his age uh, could not have approved of. Since he was uh, very much uh, in association with uh, Ezekiel uh, and contemporaries, the first book that J. Patel published uh, was published by Ezekiel and Clearing House. The first book by uh, J. Patel came out in 1966 and it was entitled Poems. If we have a look at uh, the first collection of G. Patel, we can find that there is uh, a sort of youthful aspiration of a young man who could be considered to be a sort of re rebel uh, because he came from a family of uh, rich uh, people. He was a family, he was a member of uh, the uh, rich community. His grandfather had uh, lots of land and other things, but then uh, Patel always felt himself uh, to be uh, isolated because he had his sympathies people of say not only minority, but the people who were who can be considered to be underdogs and the people who are doing menial jobs and all. So, all these uh, sympathies of uh, Patel uh, can be witnessed in his very first collection entitled uh, Poems. Now, there is uh, one poem where we can also find an imprint of uh, um, the rural background and the festivities and the poem is named uh, Nariyal Purnima. So, this Nariyal Purnima is supposedly the longest poem uh, in the first collection entitled Poems. And in this poem, this Nariyal Purnima is actually a sort of uh, festival which is celebrated on the full moon day, especially in the month of August and September. And on this uh, day, uh, people uh, actually not only gather, but they celebrate. There are certain festivities and rituals. But then in that poem also, uh, G. Patel talks about his uh, own status as being a person who is isolated and whether his sympathies uh, are with the underdogs as he himself mentions uh, in, in that poem, I uh, will find. The second collection was entitled, How Do You Withstand Body? How do you withstand body that came out? Uh, see, there is a gap of 10 years between his first collection and uh, the second collection because basically G. Patel was a doctor by profession. His father also was a dentist and that is why father might uh, be uh, feeling satisfied uh, to see his son becoming a doctor. But then as regards G. Patel himself, you know, he was actually in a very conflicting situation whether to be a doctor because poetry and uh, medicine, uh, practice and, and, and say uh, painting, there was a sort of conflict in and between. And so, uh, there is a gap uh, of his poetry writing and there is a 10 years gap between the first volume and the second one. And the third one came after again after 15 years, the third one is entitled Mirrored Mirroring that came out in the year 1991. Now, uh, it's it's quite uh, uh, a moment of uh, pleasure to know that G. Patel is still alive, and uh, he uh, lives in uh, Mumbai. Fine, uh, he is still busy, 
and uh, later on he also translated the work of 17th century Gujarati poet Akha. So, many of the works uh, have been many of uh, the works of this poet Akha has been translated by uh, G. Patel. Now, when we look at uh, the characteristic features of uh, Patel's poems, I think uh, we will take a different sort of interpretation today. First, we will look at G. Patel's poem and then we shall see uh, whether the themes uh, that G. Patel uh, discusses, uh, then, then we can uh, come to having a sort of realization as to what sort of poetry uh, is uh, being written or was being written by G. Patel. Because he becoming a doctor, you know, becoming a doctor as was the expectation of his uh, family members. So, in one of the interviews to uh, a fellow poet Arundhati uh, Subramanyam, what he himself uh, had said is uh, of utmost importance. My family wanted me to do medicine only. There were some friends who encouraged me to pursue only writing on the grounds that one would interfere with the other. But then these people began to give up on me that helped. I decided to do all three. I have been happy since then. Now, what are these three things? The first was poetry, the other was uh, becoming a physician and the third was painting. So, he actually uh, divided his time into these three and whatever he has written through his poetry, I think they actually speak volumes of his experience as a physician. But then he was completely different from other contemporary poets and you cannot find much of the imagination. So, his work is not soaked only in imagination, but then there is a different sort of the reality that as an onlooker, as an observer, uh, G. Patel himself found. Uh, in the very first uh, volume entitled Poems, as I mentioned, uh, there is uh, one poem entitled Naryal Purnima. I mean, uh, it, it, it can also be called as a coconut festival. So, in that poem, what he writes is of utmost significance and you can find that just in a very early stage, he had developed a sort of the feeling of isolation. Now, let us have a look at the lines and then you can realize and then we can attest to the poetic faith of this poet G. Patel. Do I sympathize with the underdog? Is it one more halt in the search for identity? So, he being a Parsi, he actually uh, felt himself a bit different from others, the sort of treatment that he received, the sort of recognition that he received. So, in the very first uh, collection and in the longest poem that is Nariel Purnima, where he says, our interiors could never remain quite English. Look at the lines, our interiors never could remain quite English, the local gods hidden in covers from rational Parsi eyes would suddenly turn up on the walls, garlanded alongside the king and the queen and the rulers who had such praise for our manners disappeared one day. So, look instead for something else even accept and belong. So, we can find here that there is a sort of suffering of the poet. The poet suffers, poet uh, feels himself to be an outsider and then there is a conflict between what he is and what his surroundings are and then it appears as if he is looking for or he is searching for a sort of identity. So, there is a sort of identity crisis that we can find in the very first collection of his. There are certain harsh you know, realities hidden where he says the local gods hidden and then he says because you know we, we also get a hint here our interiors never could remain quite English. Perhaps what he means to say is that we were not kowtowing before the Britishers and then there is also a reflection of his own guilt and of his own suffering and of the suffering of the community where he says that we are not quite English and then the local gods. So, when he says local gods, there are references, the references may be uh, to the leaders of those times, the references may be uh, to the people of those times who actually had become enslaved and who were actually being ruled by the Britishers and then he was actually feeling, he was actually having a sort of suffering not of his own, but of the entire country and he actually had a sort of sympathy uh, with the two. So, here we find, let us, let us see the last line. And the rulers who had such praise for our manners, perhaps our rulers might be very happy when they see ourselves being a slave, but then they disappeared one day. 
So, look instead for something else. What is that? Even accept and belong. Accept what? Belong to whom? To the country, to the community, uh, to, to a sort of faith, but then accept. So, you have to accept. So, there is a sort of horse dig that we can also find. But as a poet, because you know he divided his time between his uh, uh, practice as a doctor and then painting and then poetry. So, we find that majority of his poems they actually bear a sort of mark of his medical practice. And while he is from a medical profession, you can find this sort of even though there cannot be too many of phrases and images, but then are the words that he has used in his poetry, they actually speak much about his own profession. Let us take a poem entitled Forensic Medicine. It is, it is often said that in the first collection also, uh, there are more than 30 poems which are some way or the other related to uh, the practice of medicine. A case in point, the expert says, a woman thrust glowing fagots, where properly her son's sparrow should nest, puerile in law practice, he says, but good as any other. To set the story rolling, begin with a burn in the sparrow's nest, to extend all over there from emerging fan and flourish of the world, hold the fetus tumbling though, tumbling through, and before it may express surprise at a clean new blast of air, Lay subtle finger over mouth and nose, watch it blue. If rather you would be coarse, go ahead, use rope and hatchet. Look at the use of words. Use uh, rope and hatchet, knife, stone, bullet, all you would on the more aged bodies whose gel of blood and skin have not exchanged years against sweet ear, will not relinquish with ease. As the poem follows, you can find how the poet is actually portraying the reality of the of his own professional world and towards the end what he says is underneath kneels and liver them of fingers offer acid in a drink of wine the house of song is blasted soft skin that clothes the gentlest dunes will retract before knife and bullet proceed and now it is it is often said that as a doctor what he has done is he actually tries to mutilate the entire body even linguistically in his poems and then finally says the last line look at the last line you are now full circle with nothing not thought of not done before. We may consider uh, that uh, the way he was being treated or the sort of experiences that he had, he actually also tried to discover that in his own medical profession. That is why as a poet towards the end, what he will do? He will shock you and the last lines are very shocking. You are now full circle having, having mutilated all the limbs of the body and then says, ah, you are now full circle with nothing not thought of, not done before. Now, all this actually go to suggest that he was such a poet who actually not only talked about his own profession, but through his own profession that actually become a weapon, became a weapon for talking about not only about the underprivileged, but then there is a sort of consciousness. His poetry can be considered to be situational poetry. The style is very bare, colloquial style, not like that of a poet who actually brings lots of heaps of images uh, and phrases and all. It is of course precise and economical, but of course there are oblique references are there, oblique references are there. At times it will appear that his poetry is very difficult, very complex, but then if you have in your mind that his medical profession bears a stamp uh, on majority of his poems. There may not be poetic sentiments, yet it reflects upon actual situations not imaginative. So, we can always say that there is a sort of internal struggle and the poet is actually searching for a sort of inner peace, but body is actually body is a question that the poet always tries to struggle with and being a doctor he knows the operations of the body and one critic goes to the extent of saying that when he talks about it appears as if he is actually talking about a surgical operation my dear friends. So, we can find in the world of uh, G. Patel uh, the stamp of the medicine in one poem after another, uh, but then majority of his poems are 
majority of his poems, one poem that we read recently, Forensic Medicine, it was the title. And we can find that how the poet has, as I said, mutilated the body and finally gives you a sock. So, there are wounds and pains of human body. It appears as if doctor, he was not totally involved, but he was actually detached, detached as a poet. And then there are grotesque images that you can find. And then since there is no poetic sentiment involved, the poetry of him appears to be very prosaic. But that does not mean that J. Patel was not a poet. That actually does not negate the fact uh, that Patel was lacking in a sort of poetic sensuousness or a poetic consciousness. For example, if we take another poem entitled On Killing a Tree, we can find that through this killing of a tree, the poet actually finds that even all other creatures, even whatever flora and fauna which are around us, they also have a life of their own. So, life in various manifestations can also be a witness to majority of the poems that have been written by G. Patel. Let us take some lines from uh, this uh, poem, which not only talks about the sensuousness and the concern, it also talks about the eco-critical bent of the poet. And in a way, it also provides us a sort of voyeurism that the poet had. At times, there are overtones of sexuality that we can find. As a doctor, he has his keen sense of making a sense of, of observation as a poet. Now, let us uh, read some of the lines. It takes much time to kill a tree, not a simple jab of the knife. Look at, look at the expression, jab of the knife, again from the medical field. We will do it. It has grown slowly, consuming the earth, rising out of it, feeding upon its crust absorbing years of sunlight, air, water. So, when I read it, I actually find as if a migrant voice is speaking, is not it? Years of sunlight, air, water, which are all below the roots of the tree, they are actually suffering it. And out of his leprous hide, leprous hide, see here is actually the predicament of the poet that actually comes uh, through uh, uh, this poem, sprouting leaves hack and chop. Look at, look at the images, hack and chop, but this alone will not do it, not so much pain will do it. The bleeding bark will heal and from close to the ground will rise curled green twigs. If you simply hack and chop, you might find that the bark has been injured, but again there will leaves come up. So, there also is a sort of hope. Miniature boughs, which if unchecked will expand again to former size, no. And then he says, no, the root is to be pulled out, out of the anchoring earth. No, you simply cannot hack and chop and leave it. But if you really want to exterminate, you will have to pull out the uh, root. It is to be roped, tied and pulled out, snapped out or pulled out entirely out from the earth cave and the strength of the tree exposed. I will I'll simply go to the last stanza. And then the matter of scorching and choking in sun and air, browning hardening, twisting, withering and then it is done. So, we find here not only an image of destruction, but at the same time we find here a sort of sympathy not only for the tree, but for all those people who are rooted here and you simply want to exterminate that. So, poet in the garb of this eco-critical, you know, poems, he is actually also talking about those people who have been here on this earth for so many years, but then have been deprived of so many opportunities and all. So, there can be a sort of compassion that can be found here. Now, if we analyze this poem in greater detail, because all of you are, you know, free to analyze it, but you can find that there is a note of violence against environment, graphic images you have already found and then the death and decay of the self is also witnessed. So, not only uh, his first collection, but the second collection also when we move to the second collection, 
which is actually prevalent uh, with the images of the body and the body actually plays its part well but with the help of the body the poet actually asks so many questions and here is the poem that you can read at your own ease and your leisure and pleasure but again you can find a sort of sympathy with what the poet actually feels let us uh, take a note of some of the lines in order to understand what the poet really felt here appears to be a sort of dialogue there is no other audience but the poet is interrogating the body itself oh dear body how do you withstand how do you bear how do you tolerate and then the poet says how do you withstand body destruction repeatedly aimed at you minutes seconds like gun reports tattoo with holes your area of five by one is not room enough for the fists the blows all instruments itch now see here actually poet asks a very silent and simple question to the body how do you withstand all that as a as a medical practitioner he also might have experienced how the patients know how they are being dealt with even though for a sort of cure but then all sorts of operations all sorts of persecutions are made only on the body and the body is a witness and the body withstands so we can find a note of melancholia also here and then the poet says to make a hedgehog of your hide it is your fate poor slut to walk compliantly before heroes offering in your demolition a besotted kind of laugh dear body you have you have uh, bared everything but then you are actually walking compliantly before heroes offering in your demolition even in your destruction you are offering the besotted kind of love and then dumb discolored battered patches see the images of ravage the images of destruction the images of violence the images of cutting fine meat mouths for monsters kisses so how much has this body suffered and that is why this this volume which was the second one it is you know majority of the poems of this volume they are actually associated with body and how the body has suffered it all here i think we can uh, take a very important uh, comment by bruce king who says patel appears to be aiming at a thickly textured economical rough vigorous colloquial style no it appears as if the poet is talking to us which expresses a mind thinking through its emotions and conflicts towards some logical resolution the poet is actually trying to find a resolution but then the poet is struggling and the body and its parts they actually become the weapon uh, for the poet's resolution of the perennial uh, problem one of one of the major poems that actually uh, made g patel very famous among the poetic circles was written in the backdrop of 1969's gujarat riot and then the poet in this poem talks about how people became merciless how people had become cruel and then in an in an atmosphere of cruelty the poet what the poet writes and says the ambiguous fate of jeep patel he being neither muslim nor hindu in india so the poet here actually talks about a sort of secularism and then he also tries to give us a message that we are neither hindu nor muslim and here also we find that there is another thing which the poet actually doesn't say but he is somehow different yet he is actually considered to be deprived and this poem had become very popular we can uh, take the lines of this poem in order to understand it in greater depth and detail where the poet says to be no part of this hate is deprivation you see you see uh, the dig that is there even to be a, no part of this hate is deprivation even if you are uh, not being hated that is again a sort of deprivation that is why in one of the poems he had said to accept and to belong fine so you you should not feel that if people do not hate you you belong no even if you are being hated you belong never could i claim a circumcised future 
mangled a child out of my arms, never rave at the milk bibing, grass guzzing hypocrite. Look at the way the poet actually uses the words with the help of his uh, medical uh, knowledge at the milk bibing, grass gudging hypocrite who pulled off my mother's voluminous robes and sliced away at her dugs. Planets focus their fires into a worm of destruction, edging along the continent, bodies turn ashen and shrivel. I only burn my tail. I only burn my tail. Here the poet not only interrogates his own identity, but the identity of all those people. And there, you know, the title itself says, ah, the ambiguous fate, my fate here is ambiguous. I am neither a Muslim nor a Hindu in India. I am actually a Parsi. So there is a sympathetic note towards Parsi uh, being a minority community. But at the same time, the poet actually says that when there is an aggression, when there is a riot, I think people try to forget the differences and rather people should try to forget the differences and try to become one. Because when atrocity is done, it is not done in the name of colors because the color of everyone's blood is the same. That is why the poet says, to be no part of this hate is utter deprivation. Now, all these poems being written, I mean, when we come to the third uh, volume of the poet, we find the poet has come out from the world of all sorts of butchering, all sorts of injury and here this mirrored mirroring which came out in 1991, here we can find a sort of transition and transition from, from return, transition to return to recollection, uh, reconciliation. There is actually the beginning of a new journey that journey may be considered to be a spiritual journey. And here the poet may also talk about God. In the beginning, he actually, uh, in some of the poems he talked about, because he was very hesitant to take the name of God. But now, there is a sort of surrender, there is a sort of submission, and the poet actually appears to have tried to come to a sort of resolution. Let us take some of the lines of uh, the, uh, this collection. God or something like that sought through each part of you down to your some small fingernail well into pits and wells you did not know of beamed right into all of that. So, his entire uh, poem uh, collection of poems may appear to be very prosaic because he has as a doctor as he takes the jibe of the knife or whatsoever he also uh, does so while uh, making you know while uh, cutting his own lines. And then you will find that some of the lines are just one word line. So, it, it appears that his own expertise appears to have impacted his own writing. And here then he says, and into your crude meanness and your fruitlessness flooded might be the word for it. Translucence, you see how the word translucence has been divided. There is sort of enjambment we can say, but then it is only of words. Translucence, the sun blazing through, lifting the most of you out of sight, save for a persistence of veins. So, mirroring mirrored is a collection where the poet sows, because we have already found that in uh, how do you withstand body, there is a sort of self, you know, lamentation. But here the poet comes to make a sort of realization and there is actually a craving for a sort of a spiritual satisfaction and the poet is perhaps trying to mend his own fences my dear friend. Now having looked at the poetry collections of Jeev Patel, we have found that the poet's world is full of medical terminologies, medical vocabularies. The images that if any we can consider, they belong to the field of medicine. And linguistically also we have found that there are several cuts, hesitations in terms of lines, in terms of words. But what the contemporary poet's view of G. Patel can be very pertinent in this regard to establish or uh, to make uh, the reputation of a very contemporary uh, Indian English poet G. Patel sink. 
So, let us uh, take some of uh, the uh, criticism or critical uh, lines of G, uh, on G. Patel by his contemporary poets. In this regard, Manohar Sethi, what he says is of utmost importance. There are poets who have been prescribed poetry as therapy, poetry as therapy, because poetry soothes you during the time of leisure when you are injured, frustrated, burdened and all. So, the poet also in this regard, uh, poetry as a therapy by their strings, though I do not think Patel belongs to this category. So, he does not uh, consider Patel to belong to this uh, category of poetry as therapy, rather what he says is his poems go far beyond the personal or the so called confessional as he attempts to come to grips with the overpowering reality around him. To say that simply uh, G. Patel was a doctor and that is why his poems talk about all these things of destruction, demolition whatsoever. But then Manohar Siti says that he actually came to grips with the overpowering reality around him. So, the situation that is why he has been called a situational poet, the situation or the circumstances that were around him, they, uh, they got room uh, through uh, G. Patel's poetry. Another uh, contemporary poet, uh, Mehrotra, we have already uh, uh, learnt about Mehrotra, A. K. Mehrotra, Arvindra Krishna Mehrotra. What he says is also very uh, significant in this regard. His poems are generally lean of shape. If you, if you look at the lines, the lines are not abundant, there is not an abundant growth, but then there is a lean of shape and a spare of movement and gesture. They are characterized by quick, unexpected figurative turns and complex attitudes. His steady eyed appraisal confronts the disorienting aspects of experience on a middle ground between evasion and involvement. The poet is actually uh, trying to struggle uh, between evasion and involvement. He is in a world of medicine. Uh, he might evade, but then there is a criss cross. We find a sort of conflicting loyalties uh, of the poet. What Stephen King says is of course, very remarkable in this regard. Patel's excellent poems derive strength, much of strength from the way he is both strongly aware. So, he finds a sort of consciousness, a sort of awareness. Awareness of what? Awareness of local conditions, that is why Nariel Purnima, is not it? Awareness of what the world that he was dealing with, that is why medical profession. Yet, he defends himself from involvement. We cannot find uh, that the poet is completely involved, rather we find the poet comes out. The poet actually uh, tries to fulfill his own dharma. So, having looked at several views of contemporary poets and critics, it is now time uh, to make our own conclusion about Jeev uh, Patel. We have already found that the early poetry of Jeev Patel, I mean uh, poems which came out in 1966, they are full of protests. There appear to be often conflicts between him and his grandfather. The grandfather who was actually a rich man, but on the other hand this person I mean G. Patel was actually his sympathies were towards the servants and that is why he said, uh, that is why he said our, our you know our uh, contours or we were not quite English, our interiors were not quite English. And then we also find feelings of guilt, there is an element of professional affinity no doubt about it and detest, I mean dislike in his poems, but that shows his struggle for his own identity, for the triumph of himself. He was actually trying uh, to wage a war against the atmosphere that he was living in. There is an urge for all forms of life, because we find not only does he talk about human beings, not only does he talk about body, but also he talks about uh, the body of a tree, when the tree is ravished, when the tree is ravaged, when the tree is uprooted and how below the earth the tree, tree has actually uh, suffered sunshine, light, uh, darkness and all and all sorts of uh, ravages that the tree. But then if you really want to uproot it out, you will have to take it out, you would have to pull it out. So, finally, we can say 
uh, that the poetic world of G. Patel offers a sort of sensitivity to social injustice and suffering that is actually found major in majority of his poems. Now, having said all this, it is now time to sum up our discussion of G. Patel once again by quoting from his uh, uh, last book that is uh, Mirrored Mirroring, where he says, in the beginning it is difficult even to say God. I mean, when all of us are young, no, God actually is not a sort of possibility because you feel that there is immense potential within you. So, in the beginning it is difficult even to say God, one is so out of practice and embarrassed like lisping in public about candy at 50. So, even though there is a sort of realization, but the realization comes too late and with this we come to the end of today's discussion. My dear friends, uh, G. Patel was also a sort of existential poet who actually was trying to find his own meaning in this world where he felt himself out of the touch, where he felt himself like an outsider, where he was also actually trying uh, to search for his roots. And that is where we find him reconciliating towards the end. With this, we come to the end of today's talk. Thank you very much. I wish you all a good night.